President, fellows and guests, we're very pleased to be able to present to you the preliminary outcomes of our work relating to the discovery of a late Iron Age chariot burial from Pembrokeshire. I will start the presentation with the story of the discovery of this find, leading to the survey and exploratory excavation at the find spot in 2018, and then Ken will take over and present our work on the complete excavation of the grave and burial monument undertaken in spring this year. We shall then both cover elements of discussion and summing up during the final part of the presentation. First, we need to acknowledge the partners and funding bodies for this project. <coughs> Amgi Edvar Cymru, National Museum Wales, has worked in partnership with Dovid Archaeological Trust and CADU to make this project happen. In developing a strong engagement and community strand to the project, we've partnered with Pembrokeshire College and Planed, ensuring this project has strong Pembrokeshire roots and relevance. We'd like to acknowledge the support of the National Lottery Heritage Fund in Wales, who have provided significant grant funding to enable this project to happen. We're also very grateful to the Headley Trust, who have just agreed to provide a significant grant award towards our acquiring the artefacts from this site as a treasure group for the National Collection in Wales. So the story begins in February 2018, when metal detectorist Mike Smith reported a stunning group of chariot fittings decorated in the late Laten art style with red glass insets as a possible treasure find. They date to the first century AD and they were made and used just before or around the time of the invasion of Western Britain by the Roman army. This is the first contact I had with Mike early last year when he sent me this email with attached photographs. Dear Mr Wilt, my name is Mike Smith, I'm a member of Pembrokeshire Prospectors and believe I've found the Celtic chieftains with chariot burial, could you please ring me on? I was initially sceptical about it being a chieftain's chariot burial. The existing comparable evidence we had from Wales suggested the greater likelihood of a hoard of objects buried in a pit but without a human burial. However, on the basis of what we've now discovered, I'm very happy to keep my words on this. As a National Museum curator, one of my responsibilities is to report to coroners in Wales on prehistoric treasure finds to help them to determine whether finds are legally treasure. So in March last year, I met with Mike and visited the site of the find spot. And here you can see on the left, Mike with his metal detector. As this group of reported chariot fittings represented one of the most important groups of Celtic art from Wales, and the first from Pembrokeshire, I was keen to investigate the find spot more closely. Firstly, to see if more artefacts still remained in the ground, as additional potential treasure items, and secondly, to try to understand why and how they were buried here. During this visit, we re-identified and marked the exact place of the find together. Remarkably, in the immediate vicinity of the find, we discovered a previously unrecorded Iron Age promontory fort with three lines of ramparts surviving. Given the significance of the find, located close to an impressive upstanding archaeological monument, Amgyad Vakamri also commissioned Dr Tim Young of GeoArc to undertake a small geophysical survey over the immediate find spot to see if any linked archaeology survived buried here, and you can see Tim taking readings with the magnetometer on the right-hand slide. Here are some photographs of the three lines of upstanding ramparts of the fort, with their still traceable external ditches. To give you some scale, here at the top right is uh, my colleague Mark Lewis at the bottom of a ditch with our volunteer Adele at the top of one of the rampart banks. It's still around four metres high from base to top. When Tim accessed the LIDAR survey coverage of the area, the shape of the three ramparts cutting off a promontory were clearly indicated. The promontory was defined on two sides by steep-sided valleys with converging stream beds at their base. So if I just mark the 
can see the, the lines of the ramparts there and then the promontory defined there. <coughs> and you can see on the left Tim's geophysics survey plot as accurately superimposed over the LIDAR plot on the left hand side. This survey clearly showed two further hillfort ditches and additional circular monuments to the west of the visible fort and in the area of the find spot. And when we looked at the detail, we could see that the chariot finds had been made in the middle of an apparently circular ditched monument, nine metres in diameter, which was located in a rectangular enclosure, seemingly added as a late addition to an elaborated <coughs> hillfort entrance. At the centre of the circular feature was a very high peak or archaeological anomaly, suggesting a central feature containing metal artefacts. This provided really strong evidence that the original burial context of the chariot fitting still survived and needed to be explored further. To show the upstanding ramparts in more detail, this is the contour survey of the promontory fort. And the site was surveyed in early spring this year before the ground vegetation in this woodland had grown up too much. The ramparts are most impressive on the southern side and defining the presumed entrance. The inner two ramparts are closely spaced and parallel, however the outer third line is separated by a wider gap and appears to have a more irregular curve. We know very little yet for sure about the occupation of the interior or the date of development of the fort, however the features that we can see now from the survey and geophysics suggest a multiple phased fort. So in June last year we were able to undertake a week of preliminary excavation to have a look at the artefact find spot as part of an ongoing treasure case. The work was carried out by Angia Thakumri and Devad Archaeological Trust staff working in partnership with additional CADU grant funding. And here you can see some of the working shots of the, the work undertaken in very hot weather. And on the left-hand slide, I'm talking to the landowner. At this point, I'd like to thank the landowners and their family for all the help, support and interest they've given throughout this project while we've been working on their farm. They're quite proud to be the people currently caring for and farming on this land, now known to have been occupied for so long by their ancient and predecessors. Here on the bottom <coughs> left, you can see the trench area we opened up over the middle of the circular ditch monument feature. At the centre, we identified a large sub-rectangular shaped patch of clay infilling a deeper archaeological feature. And this is shown in the top left photograph. We quarter sectioned this clay layer, excavating down into the pit feature. And what we revealed on the western side of the pit <coughs> were the tops of two curved iron wheel tyres on an east-west alignment and running in parallel with each other. You can see one of these on the top right slide. This provided strong evidence for a chariot burial where the chariot had been buried whole and upright with the wheels still attached to the axle. We could identify these as wheel tyres by comparison with examples in the National Collection from St. Kenneth Bach on Anglesey. As the chariot wheels were potentially large and buried deep, it became clear that this unexpected discovery could not be excavated in a rush and needed more time and resources to investigate properly and carefully. Dr Mark Lewis, a conservator and expert in the care and treatment of ancient ironwork, advised that the iron was both fragile and now unstable, but could be temporarily restabilised by reburying with sieved soil over the tyres. We were also fortunate that Dr. Kate Roberts, Chief Inspector at CADU, was able to visit the site to inspect the find whilst it was uncovered. And it was decided the best course of action would be to carefully cover the site to protect it, and then to return to excavate the grave when more time and funding had been made available. This slide shows the group of metal detector <coughs> finds and the artefacts discovered during last year's excavation. I'll talk further about their interest and significance later in the presentation, but for the purposes of treasure reporting, I was able to identify them as being an associated group of Iron Age artefacts of consistent style and date of manufacture during the mid-first century AD. In other words, this was a prehistoric 
Base Metal Artifact Association, which satisfied the legal definition. They were accordingly declared treasure at the end of January this year, and they're currently going through the treasure valuation process at the British Museum, and Anki-Edva Cymru will be acquiring them for the National Collection in just the next week or two. A continuing concern over the autumn and winter of last year was the desire to protect the site, now potentially at risk from night hawk metal detectorists, who might damage the site and remove artefacts still in the ground without having permission to detect on the land. With this in mind, CADU scheduled the fort and find spot to protect it by law, and we were not able to release any information to the public about the site until after the archaeology had been fully explored. We also worked with David Powers Police and the landowners to make sure that the ongoing threat was being monitored. So the pressure was now on to form a funded plan and partnership enabling the grave to be excavated and the remaining artefacts to be safely lifted <coughs> before they decayed in the ground or were robbed. It was agreed that uh, spring this year was the best time for an excavation. The partnership was set up with both Amgedva Cymru and Cadu contributing significant resources to the project. However, further financial support was needed to make this happen, so we applied to the National Lottery Heritage Fund in Wales, and in February this year we were told we'd been successful. In our funding application, we said we wanted to work in a particular way in delivering this major museum and heritage project to reflect the commitments and values of Amgiedva Cymru. We wanted to work through partnership with other organisations developing opportunities for participation, volunteering, and community engagement. The excavation team would comprise a mix of David Archaeological Trust experienced volunteers, three PhD students of archaeology from Cardiff University, and a team of young student volunteers from Pembrokeshire College. In particular, we wanted to work with young people interested in their heritage <coughs> to offer them genuine opportunities to be involved with a major archaeological discovery on their doorstep, to be part of the team, to learn new skills and to create film and archive footage which would itself become part of the national collection and would be core to presenting the project in years to come. I'll now hand over to Ken for the next part. I was having noted there that uh, one of the concerns was that this site was only vulnerable to illegal mess detecting. And during the winter, the last winter, I did visit the site several times just to check on how it happened to it, and it was quite clear that nothing had done. And the landowner reported that actually he'd seen no suspicious activity whatsoever in the area. So we're fairly confident that things have been kept fairly confidential. Can you hear that? Is that better now? Can you move the microphone? Is that better? Yeah. Okay, sorry. So we, we had concerns about the site, but they were uh, not justified as it was. The landowner was quite confident there's no interference with it. So in March this year, uh, we went to the site and stripped the area over the chariot area itself, and some of the trenches as well, which I'll talk about just at the end there briefly. We see there the, the area exposed. You see that the, the, the trenches were dug in the previous springtime, and I think on the bottom photograph, you just got to see the ring ditch begin to appear. I will say the site was, was not the easiest to work on. The geology is, is not good. And people have worked on, or have worked on silo in shales, on fishing shales in southwest Wales, just to know how intractable they are. Uh, particularly when they are uh, the top metre or so, is very much damaged by the polyglacial activity. So the geology was very, very difficult. And you can see there that the ring which doesn't show particularly well, even when cleaned up. Well, there's a plan of what we exposed on the pre-excavation plan. And you can see from that the parallel lines are, are plough marks. And the site had been deep ploughed and several years ago with potatoes. And the two little holes in the centre there you can make out uh, are where the fire spots. The one on the right hand end of the uh, subrectangular feature is where a bridle bit was found, and the one left in the centre is where a large horse brooch was found, which I'm going to talk about later on. 
and it looks as though both those have been disturbed by ploughing and gone off to the surface. So hence the, the detectors could actually discover them and detect them in the, perhaps in the base of the topsoil. Otherwise it may have been uh, more securely uh, let, let lower down and not been discovered. You see also the wind ditch does seem to be planular with a possible gap or entrance on the southeast side. Again, a bit more on that later on. The weather was not kind, to say the least. Uh, we had a shelter, uh, but for the first two weeks we were unable to put it up. We had gale force winds constantly for two weeks. Uh, our portaloos blew away, other things blew away. Uh, but eventually we did get it up over the barrier itself. Uh, and you can see there on the bottom left, I think you might just be able to make out the, the chariot tyres begin to be exposed to tops of them. And also, between the, oh, sorry, to the right of the small ranging pole, a, small, a sword is going to appear there, which I'll show you in a second, better photograph of that. This is the sword positioned between the two wheels and where you expect to find the box of the chariot. Other artifacts are there as well, but I want to emphasise here, first of all, the severity of this particular artefact in Wales. It's a, a Type 4 long sword, late Iron Age, 1st century AD, BC, of which there's only three, and this is one of them, known from Wales. One was from the Flinkery Bach Horde, which Adam mentioned earlier, in the group of network from that small lake. Another one is from a, a, a pommel burial found in 1909 in Anglesey, and that's it. So exactly bare objects, but also just how bare artefacts are in West Wales generally in the Iron Age. For those who've ever worked on an Iron Age site in Western Wales, you may excavate a complete small hill fort, large and enclosure, and after the excavation, come away with a, a spindle wool, part of chrome stone, and a couple of pieces of Roman pottery if you're lucky. So actually you get this quality of material is not just unusual, it's, it is unique for the area. So here's the sword, uh, and you see that it's probably not in good condition. And so the decision was made to, to lift it as a, as a whole piece. So you see the conservatives there at the National Museum, Mark Lewis, Louise Mumford, uh, wrapped in cling film, uh, and then in plaster Paris branches, and undermining it to get some bores underneath it to get it as best we can lift it whole. I think it was fairly successful. I think that's, that's broken slightly, but uh, that was a reasonably successful operation to get out of the ground. And that's, again, you see some slides that being x rayed and so forth later on. There's just some of our volunteers, and I would say at this stage that, that we couldn't have done the excavation without that input. As Adam said, about six volunteers altogether. Some of them have got a lot of experience, uh, probably more so than many professional archaeologists. Some of them are now working as volunteers on various sites for, for 10 years. Uh, and that's just acknowledged that their input in not good conditions. The early spring wasn't the best time to excavate as otherwise and they were just soldiered on uh, every single day, turned up at 8 o'clock, and went that way through to 5, 6 o'clock some evenings. The wheels of the chariot. You can see there that rather unusually they, they are squashed down and damaged. And we debated uh, long about this on site and, and later on, about the, how that's happened. Uh, our general feeling now is actually what has happened there is that the, the, the wheels have been squashed down post deposition. Actually, we feel that the child was put in the ground complete. Uh, the wheels are about 1 metre 10 in diameter, which is considerably larger than standard chariot wheels, which are about 90 centimetres on average, the ones known from elsewhere in Britain. Uh, and uh, they were we looked long and hard for any organic remains, any staining on uh, spokes or 
wooden rims for those wheels. And there was none whatsoever. I think the saw is just not conducive to that sort of preservation, unfortunately. You can see there the we did quite carefully excavate to try and expose the spokes that had been there. So our feeling now is what happened is that those wheels were put in the ground complete uh, as the wood has rotted. Uh, that there must have been a mound, a substantial mound over them, squashing down the wheels, and the two hubs you can see there then just dropped down complete as the wheels decay. The, the, the hubs dropped complete. Uh, simply because within them we feel there's a lot of animal grease and fat as lubricant which actually has held them together while they prevent them from getting complete uh, while they, they fell down. The hubs themselves, or naves, uh, were, had uh, inside outside bronze copper alloy hoops to them, which I think now they are decorated uh, hoops, and two linchpins one to aid the wheel. Iron linchpins with bronze decoration at the ends, which again I will show a few more slides those later on. That's the drawings of those two wheels. You can see quite squashed down. There's no evidence of any box to the chariot surviving or evidence of the axle between them. But we do feel it's just about scope for those chariots we put in the ground with the actual axle resting <coughs> on the shallow face of the pit, which is the, the, between the two deeper wheel pits. So essentially the chariots put in the ground, two deep wheel pits are dug to take the chariot, and it looks as though the bridle bits were placed at the end where the horses' heads would have been. There was no evidence of the horses themselves would have been buried there. In fact, there's no evidence of any direct evidence of any body actually in the ground itself. Although we do, again, feel that actually was one there, which again, we'll say a bit now, at the end about that. But again, the acid soils on the site means any bone spotted very quickly. There's not even a trace of bone, no staining or whatsoever. The Mark Lewis of the National Museum was the basic analysis of the manganese deposits below where the burial may have been, and it's highlighted actually the way that does indicate the burial on the ground. And we will do phosphate analysis and post excavation to try and determine what the possibility of there being a burial there. There's some of the students uh, working on the site, some of the young people from Pembroke College. I think one has gone on to do archaeology university and one history. Uh, so it's been uh, a useful uh, uh, experience for them. That's the plan of the site post excavation. <coughs> uh, you see the, the, the central grey pit, the, the suboval pit, is very shallow, about 15 centimetres deep total. The two wheel pits deeper off to come over the wheels. The surrounding circular ditch, plan the ditch, uh, quite well defined there. Within the gap or entrance into it, two grey or two grey shaped hollows, uh, one uh, cutting through another one. The latest one had a large stone on the surface, which you feel could have been looked like marker stone, perhaps about a metre high. And again, we've debated this long and hard whether what we're seeing here is a, is a quarry ditch with quite a large mound which we put over the chariot itself. Uh, it's difficult to quite see how it would work exactly with a, a gap or entrance on the southeast side. Uh, it is interesting to note that's about the size of a, of a mound house you expect to get in southwest Wales. Whether that's significant or not, whether it's a reused mound house or a symbolic mound house is, is open to debate. Uh, two of the features there as well, so the very top is a nice oval shaped pit which we, we suspect would have been a crouched burial. Again, we'll do some analysis on the soils to try and determine that. Uh, and the only feature which has got the possibility of getting radiocarbon dates from is that small pit in the back of the bottom which cuts through the ring ditch. Quite a, a chunk of a rich fill for that, which we'll get some dates from. Uh, 
and that's the side of excavators. The bottom left hand photograph is looking across was the Ling Ditch Chariot Bell towards the hill fort. And you can see the trees in the background to give some idea of scale from that. While we were doing excavation, we took the opportunity to do more geodetic survey across the whole field and some adjoining fields. And they haven't got the slide that was showing up the results of that. We are trying to keep uh, this information a bit confidential at the moment for various reasons. Basically, there's a lot of information, a lot of data coming out of that field. Essentially, what we've got there, as far as the two ring ditches which I've showed earlier, this particular one with a chariot and one a bit further out, we have about 12 ring ditches slightly further out from the hill fort itself. Uh, which would indicate um, a cemetery. They're not, uh, normally in South Wales, well, that would be interpreted as a Bond Age cemetery. If it is so, it's the largest Bond Age cemetery perhaps in Wales. Uh, but some of the cemetery features of those pits are very large. Uh, the largest one is probably about two and a half metres long. Very underground age like in nature for a grave. So we could well have a, an Iron Age. Cemetery associated with Hillport, in which case it's unique uh, and could contain more artifacts, uh, although none of them indicate, those things indicate uh, the, 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 the size of an iron object which the charity has got here. So <coughs> that's proven a bit of a headache for protection, and to keep the cabin, we have to do a particular site for legal purposes. Because it is a very, very large site now put up on their hands, which they probably will schedule. Uh, but again, that is only legal protection. I mentioned the, a couple of ditches we, sections we've done. This is the, the geological survey showed those outer defensive ditches. This is just a section across one of them there, just showing the size, about four metres across, two, two and a half metres deep. Um, I expect to be a bit deeper. We normally when we dig these uh, ditches on our own sites in West Wales, they are B-shaped rather than sort of open U-shaped. Uh, that's the size of down the right hand side. Within the, the stony layer about midway down had a, a lot of iron working within it and Roman pottery. Not a lot of Roman pottery, about 20 shirts altogether, which is a lot for West Wales. But uh, that is and this particular ditch is 3rd, 4th century in date, which suggests suburban activity. The section we looked through the, one of the other ditches had a few shares of Roman pottery, which was 1st century in date, which would suggest military activity in West Wales. Adam, what are the artifacts now? Yeah. I'm going to take the time. Yeah. So at this point I'd like to spend a few minutes covering the dating and some of the significances of the chariot fittings and the grave artefacts. Stylistically they're late, decorated with a combination of style 5 and style 6 decorative motifs in the late Latin art style, which can confidently be dated to the 1st century AD and provide strong dating evidence for the chariot, chariot burial. On the left is the large horse brooch, um, in his 1952 paper, it was Cecil Fox who suggested that large horse brooches may have been attached to a horse blanket covering one of the ponies. Interestingly, our single example was located approximately at one and a half metres behind the large terret, perhaps suggesting a method of attachment between <coughs> and to the rear end of the pony pair, a single fitting. The two legs are on separate hinges and would have moved with the ponies. In form, the piece looks like a pony face with legs, and this was probably a deliberate matching of the decoration to the intended use for equine display. It's decorated with red glass insets of distinctive Iron Age rather than Roman technology. A close published parallel from Britain, as shown at the bottom of left, comes from the Polden Hill Hoard in Somerset, now in the British Museum's collection. This hoard is securely dated to around AD 50 to 70, and I'd suggest a similar date of manufacture is also likely for our brooch. 
On the right-hand side is a large decorated turret or rain guide. It would have been located centrally on the chariot yoke and the reins for the two ponies would have gone through the central ring. This flat ring type with impressed red glass decoration is one of the largest and most ornate known in Britain. In Wales, the nearest parallel, shown here at the bottom right, comes from the lesser garth Pentyrchord near Cardiff, which is also thought to be dated to the early or mid 1st century AD. <clears throat> here at the top left is a decorated harness mount called the Strap Union, and it's an example of a class with a large decorated flat plate surface and with four projecting lobes as described and published by Richard Feacham as a note in the Antiquities Journal for 1991. In decorative terms, they exhibit style 5 and 6 of the 10 art motifs and are generally dated through other horde associations to the 1st century AD. At the bottom left are two further examples in the National Collection for Wales from Ash Wen, neath Port Talbot, and Mainly Camp Hillfort, Ronda the Kamantar. On the right-hand side, you can see the bridle bit we found during the excavation. The central links would have gone in the pony's mouth, and the leather reins would have attached to the side rings. This is a two-link bit with elaborate links and two decorated terminals with an opposing double trumpet design. Similar two-link bits are found in large numbers in the Polton Hill Horde, although these do not have decorated circular link terminals, as on this example. On typological and stylistic grounds, though, this bridle bit may also be considered as 1st century AD in date. Here, then, is the combined group of bronze and glass fittings. It was apparent that pairs of bridle bits and strap unions are represented. So at the bottom right, uh, we've been able to identify fragments from a second strap union with exactly the same form and decoration as the complete example, while at the top left are fragments of a second identical bridle bit. Two points are worth highlighting here. Firstly, that these fittings form an elaborate and chronologically coherent set. Secondly, their date of manufacture during the 1st century AD marks out this chariot burial as significantly later and younger than all the other known chariot burials in southern Scotland and Yorkshire, which span from the 5th to early 2nd centuries BC. This means that this chariot burial has a unique story to tell. It was probably buried during the mid to later 1st century AD, around the period when the Roman army was invading and campaigning in Western Britain. Since the completion of the excavation of the grave, the artefacts retrieved from the excavation, which are now largely encased within plaster bandages, are being monitored in our conservation laboratory. For the large tyre fragments and wheel fittings, we needed to be able to access an industrial X-ray facility with a large chamber, as a first step towards understanding them and stabilising them. We're grateful to Ian Nicholson and colleagues at TWI Technology Centre, Wales, and Port Talbot for their help and input here. They worked with us on two days in June, getting the large artefacts scanned. And here, top centre, you can see one of the nave hoop and lynch pin soil blocks in the X-ray chamber. On the second day of X-raying, our student volunteers were also able to visit TWI and see the new scans being generated of the artefacts. On the 26th of June, a day visit was organised to the Archaeology Conservation Laboratory at the National Museum Cardiff, so our student volunteers could come and see the conservation care processes and stabilisation work now being undertaken on the artefacts. On this day, we also released the story of the discovery to the press and media, so the students were involved with giving TV and radio interviews on the day. To bring things up to date, the student volunteers have just recently presented their film for the first time, relating to their experience of the excavation on the 9th of November at the Pembrokeshire Archaeology Day held in their college in Haverford West. 200 people attended this event and the film was very well received. I was also able to present on the archaeology of the project and we sought the views and feedback from those attending about how they would like the project to develop in its next stages. 
So here on the left is the x-ray of the hilt end of the sword. Careful analysis of the images on a large screen revealed that the handle grip for the sword was made of segmented pieces of bone or antler. Iron corrosion was gathered at the joints between the segments. Mineralised wood impressions in the corroded surfaces suggest that the sword was buried in a wooden scabbard. On the right is an X-ray scan image showing one of the large, elaborate curved linchpins with a ring head. <coughs> Simpler iron parallels for these are known, for example in the Sinkerig Bath religious lake deposit and the Polden Hill board. Our elaborate and large matching pair have iron shanks with copper alloy rim, heads and base caps. The outline of a distorted copper alloy nave hoop is also visible, while an unexpected discovery was the survival of four iron rings, two on each wheel, originally fitted around the wooden chariot axle and importantly giving us the dimension of the missing axle. Located beside the sword at the blade tip end were these two iron fragments. The upper fragment appears to be a ferrule of a spear, while the lower one appears to be an iron chain containing the blade tip of a possible dagger or second sword. To corroborate the presence of a wooden shaft, probably of a spear, we've also pieces of spiral iron binding attached to which are mineralised fragments of a wooden shaft. They extend in a line beside the complete sword. However, unfortunately, no spear blade was discovered. So these add to the range of weapons accompanying this burial and further serve to emphasise its high status. There are additional iron artefacts in the central grave area, which we're still looking at and considering. They include a number of iron rings and bolts, the latter probably fittings linked with the chariot platform structure. At this point, we ought to return to the difficult question of where the inhumation burial was placed and consider who this person may have been. Unfortunately, as Ken has already mentioned, in this acidic soil no human bone has survived, which is so frustrating for us in wanting to tell the full story of this chariot burial. But we can explore some tentative evidences and make comparisons and inferences. Next to the sword and between the wheels, we did observe patches of a darker organic soil stain, so as Ken has said, we're hopeful that analysis of these may provide some tentative evidence of where the burial was once placed. The location of the sword, where the platform of the chariot structure would once have been, is also suggestive. Elsewhere, where chariot burials have been excavated in more alkaline soils, where bone does survive, human burials have been found in the location of the chariot pl platform in front of the wheels, and also sometimes as burials accompanied with swords as grave goods. So here at the bottom centre we have a burial placed on the box or platform of a complete chariot at Ferry Fryston, West Yorkshire. And on the right we have a skeleton with sword placed in a grave beside a disassembled chariot from Wetwang Slack in East Yorkshire. So with our burial it does seem highly likely that the sword was placed next to the person in the grave. Unfortunately we cannot say whether the person was male or female, old or young. The evidence is simply gone. What we can suggest is that the presence of a sword and spear in the grave denoted a person of high standing in their Iron Age community and society, and burying a person with such an elaborate and highly decorated chariot was also an exceptional mark of their social standing. I've just split this slide into the presentation to give you some visualisation of what these chariots may once have looked like. Sir Cyril Fox, then director of the National Museum of Wales, was the first archaeologist to attempt this reconstruction drawing, bottom left, of what a British Iron Age chariot looked like in 1946, based upon the chariot fittings discovered at Llenkerig Bath on Anglesey. Full-scale replicas have been made, based upon more recent chariot burial finds made in East Yorkshire and Scotland. Robert Herford, a wheelwright and chariot maker based in Somerset, has already been involved with our project and funding permitting, we'd be very keen to be able to commission a replica based on this find and as an engaging means of public interpretation. 
To return to the question of the person buried, a little more may be suggested by considering the placing of this grave. The grave within its defined circular ditch, and probably mounded over after the burial was placed, is the focal feature within a rectangular enclosure attached to an elaborate entrance of a long-established promontory fort. This has a deliberate and ceremonial feel, as if the person was closely linked with this important defended place. People would have walked past this grave on the approach to the fort, being made aware of the ancestral presence protecting or watching over them. The character of the ring ditch surrounding the grave pit, with its southeast facing entrance, as Kenneth said, is not dissimilar in shape, size, and alignment of an Iron Age roundhouse, although there were certainly no post holes within this ditch to indicate a house structure ever existed here. Soon after the chariot burial was placed, two intercutting graves were deliberately inserted, precisely blocking its entrance. No human bone survived in either. However, Ken has pointed out the, the possible marker stone or lining stones, and the features are of a human proportion. And there's the further probable flexed or crouched burial found immediately to the northwest of the ring ditch. This entrance blocking must have been a conscious and symbolic act soon after the chariot grave was created. And one wonders how these three individuals may have been related or associated with the person in the central grave. On the basis of these observations, we can reasonably suggest that the circular enclosure may have served as a temporary mortuary enclosure, marking out and defining the house of the dead when the burial was laid out on the chariot. In seeking to find some broader parallels for the ceremonial aspects of this exceptional first AD burial, it's perhaps helpful to look at the kinds of structures and sites also appearing elsewhere at the same time. Here is the East Anglian site of Thetford, Fice and Way, excavated by Tony Gregory in the early 1980s. In the later two phases, the site was dominated by a central ceremonial enclosure and gathering place, but it is clear that there are a range of interesting circular burial enclosures and mortuary structures placed within rectilinear enclosures around the peripheries and during the middle decades of the first century AD. Some further resonance may be found in looking at the ceremonial burial enclosure, later converted into a Romano-Celtic temple at Folly Lane in the Oppidum at Verulamium. Here a cremation burial was inserted into a central sunken rectangular shaft, located at the centre of a rectilinear enclosure during the mid-first century AD, around AD 55. The burial was then mounted over. Amongst the grave goods which had been burnt on the pile of the body were a rich array of high-status metalwork items, including chariot pieces of Iron Age and Romanizing style. The large horse brooch on the left is similar to our example from Pembrokeshire. While certainly not suggesting a direct correlation between the two sites, the layout as a central primary feature within a rectilinear enclosure the expression of an elite identity making reference to horses and chariots, and the mounding over of a chamber are common and contemporary themes. These perhaps help us to interpret what we are for the first time seeing in Pembrokeshire. Similar burial sites and structures may now quite plausibly start to appear and be identified in greater numbers in this region, which will enable better regional contextualisation of this evidence. The presence of such burials does have important implications on how we interpret the internal processes of social development and the expression of elite identities within these Western Late Iron Age communities and societies, and this is a key issue we will need to address in taking the interpretation of this evidence forward. Now Ken's just going to cover the last few black slides. Just a bit of additional context. Southwest Wales and the Iron Age, they're very much dominated by small hill forts and defended enclosures. You see a distribution map there. Uh, about 700 of perhaps 800 now are known. <coughs> Some of the excavated, just, just a handful. Uh, we see that the Coventry forts are quite well represented in that, if you list. 
and the one which was newly discovered one in the social justice chariot is fairly typical of the comedy court in South West Wales. Quite heavily defended, multi ballot, enclosing quite a small internal area. Uh, it's probably about 70 or 80 in non comedy courts that makes you known in the region. And just a bit about the, the known Roman conquest of South West Wales. This is the <coughs> pattern of, of forts <coughs> and roads uh, as known during the conquest period. Since uh, this map has been drawn as a new uh, fort we newly discovered, round about uh, the heading west, the most far west road there, just about the lettering there, the fort at Whiston, quite a large Roman fort. Essentially the conquest uh, is from 72, 74 AD and then the troops were withdrawn uh, and returned around about 80, 82 AD to finish the conquest. And by about 110, 120, uh, the military seemed to have withdrawn. So we're right on, spot on for uh, the charity being that sort of conquest period, military conquest period. And one of the things that has come out of this particular project is the fact that we haven't really been looking outside hillforts and promontory forts. We've looked at the internal areas of some of them, uh, but we've unknown what happens outside. And the chariot discoveries really sort of raise that particular issue to the front, particularly for conservation and management of these particular sites. Normally, uh, when you shed your site, it's right at the edge of the earthworks, and what's outside is just left. So, we're doing, under, doing a project at the moment which is looking at some handful of sites through geophysics. and. This is one of them, I've just got results of just two of those. You may recognise the name here, Wales and Bath. Uh, this is excavated by Jeff Wainwright in the late 1960s. And the bit he excavated was just that bit there. It's about it's a very scale, it's about 50 metres across to the side. And once he excavated, actually, the site was then bulldozed and flattened, uh, strangely. Anyway, uh, but outside that, you can see. Uh, at least three lines of proper defensive ditch running out in that port itself. And there is at least one green ditch further out from that. So quite clearly these sites are far more extensive than appears to some of the earthworks to survive. And just another example here, a smaller site. Uh, the Pompey Fort is, is at the bottom in the trees, the defences uh, tree covered the internal areas again very similar to the one uh, the chariot uh, triangular shaped. And again you see there no surface evidence outside in that field, but there's a quite clear substantial ditch with small enclosure attached to it. What that is is anyone's guess, but one assumes that it is associated with the concrete core. We've done about six or seven of these sites so far, and every single one has had positive results. So it has a big implications for Management of these sites, but also increasing our knowledge of actually what is happening outside them. And just to end, John, so this is a quite That's self explanatory. Well, I did propose it self explanatory on that side of what's, what's going to happen. Um, the second Treasury report is having to prepare at the moment for the death of the coroner, uh, uh, which is done. Soon before after Christmas? Just after Christmas. Just after Christmas, yeah. okay. Uh, and then the, the National Museum will then go about acquiring all the objects. Uh, and quite clearly, we've got a lot of post excavation work to do. Uh, the main part of the work is going to be obviously conserving all those objects. Uh, there'll be further community engagement. We were hoping to do some more field work on the site, but it's uh, Cadu are uh, not keen for us to do so, they're very concerned now that they have enough information to show you a very large area associated with the Hillport outside of Hillport. And they're not keen for us to go back and do some further intrusive work. It's rather a pity. But they haven't ruled out a uh, possible research project at some time in the future, when you can be found to it. Uh, and then possible reconstruction of the chariot, and of course then exhibitions some years down the line, hopefully with a reconstructed chariot and all the artifacts on display. So it's only the beginning of the story really at the moment, it's a long way to go with this particular project. Um, thank you very much for
Спасибо. Okay.